But I would like to call um, on stage our co-moderators, Mr. Rajesh Daniel, Head of Communication for SEI Asia, and Mr. Dwight Jason Ronan, Senior Program Manager, Australian Embassy in Thailand, for our okay for our <laughs> media session. Let's give them a round of applause. Oh, okay. Hello. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know it has been a very inte intellectually stimulating day, um, but we still have one more session, and we would like this to be very engaging so that, you know, we have a... I think one of the visual summaries a while ago highlighted the value or the importance of storytelling. So that's what we're going to do this afternoon. So with, without further ado, I would like to call in Rajesh to lay out the foundation for this session. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you all for your patience. This is the last session. And uh, we hope, as Carl said, you've been all intensely uh, participating in this. Please do that for this session too. This one's about the media. And for those who, of you who might be wondering why, uh, we have a few things that we want to explore in this session. We have three media people here. Uh, Dwight will introduce them. But I just want to lay out, set the scene for this session a little bit, uh, what we're going to do. Media is a powerful player, we know this. Media reaches public, uh, uh, shapes public opinion, we know this. Uh, media reaches policymakers, we know this. So we want to explore a little bit about how media does climate reporting. That's the first thing we want to do. And we want to share, uh, we want to get uh, media people to share their perspectives on what climate reporting means and what do they need. Sorry, thanks, Stefan. Um, the second thing is how do we strengthen these media science policy partnerships? Because often there is, there's always some disconnect. There's always some grumbling about, you know, media didn't quote me properly or uh, media saying they, that we got a 30 page document and we had to do it in one hour, things like that. We'll get into that. And the last thing is that climate stories themselves are not just about climate. The media knows this. Uh, they're often about local context. It's also about setting the science in local realities and very important for us and that's why we have the empower in the title sometimes it's giving voice to people on the margins people who cannot tell their stories and media gives them a chance to tell their stories so these are the three things that we want to explore and now i'm going to hand over to dwight yes. to invite the panelists and moderate moderate the session Great. Um, so now we would like to invite, as Rajesh mentioned, we have an esteemed panel of journalists, or should I say science communicators, uh, this afternoon. So I would like to call on the three panelists, and I will introduce them later more in depth uh, once we ask the question. So we have with us Ms. Mille, an inter independent journalist from Vietnam. Please give him a warm round of applause. We also have Kun Piapon Wunroang, founder editor of Bangkok Tribune. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Anton Delgado, a journalist for Southeast Asia Globe. So while they're making their way on the stage, uh, I'm sure, as Rajesh mentioned, today ha there has been a lot of learnings. I'm sure you've seen a lot of new statistics, new ideas. But at the same time, there's also a lot of unlearnings. I think that's very important to challenge existing perspectives that we have and our existing biases that we have and um, it's also the process of looking into different issues in a different lens which may which may not have prior to that so as i've mentioned we have three um distinguished speakers for this panel um i would like to start with miss mille uh, miss mille is actually an in independent journalist based in ho chi minh in vietnam but before that she was a television reporter for uh vietnam national uh vietnam national television right so um my question to you miss mille is uh from your experience in reporting uh about climate change basically what do you think are the potentials and the challenges that a media person face uh, in reporting these issues, specifically in the context of the Mekong region. Um, thank you, Dwight, for the question. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very thankful for this opportunity to uh, engage you, these team uh, scientists and policy makers with the media. Uh, so um, 
there is one thing that I think uh, you should know about me is that I used to give up journalism and find my way back. Um, so can I have my slide, please? Mm. Uh, so like uh, Drive said, I started out to work in news broadcasting, which uh, usually has to be quick and short. So um, um, many years ago, next slide, please. Uh, I so this that was me many years ago. So I had to give repeatedly give a report on um, the worsening in high tide in Ho Chi Minh City, and um, and at that time, standing in the political water, um, I realized that um, suddenly it came to me that uh, what I said on the news is quite shallow. Uh, so I decided to quit journal uh, journalism and then join NGO uh, work and learn about public engagement with science. And uh, to be honest, I spend time with the scientists more than spending time with my lover. So uh, I I've learned a lot. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, uh, scientific science and environmental reporting don't come naturally to journalists like me. And uh, so um, I believe that understanding is the result of uh, really close interaction and collaboration with uh, the, the, the scientist, the researcher. Um, and uh, so um, back to the present time, uh, I now I focus on uh, slow journalism and explanatory journalism because uh, I think that um, I will have more space and time to um, for the content creators and the audience to digest complex uh, information. Um, so to me, um, uh, ideally, uh, climate change reporting in the Mekong region should be about giving people hopes and uh, tell them how to make the hopes come true uh, with all the necessary scientific evidences. And um, so, um, from my experience uh, from uh, reporting in Vietnam, I observed three situations. Uh, the first one, the media of Vietnam now is talking too much about the problems and uh, that create news avoidance uh, in people, especially young people. And um, secondly, uh, because in Vietnam, the newsroom uh, need to be owned by the state. So we also, uh, um, we also talk about climate policies, but uh, most of the time they are full of uh, big and technical works that prevent people from the local, from rural area and vulnerable, vulnerable group to uh, join the discussion. And um, so um, to find my way out of the, the problems, I try to include solution in my reporting. And, uh, but it's not easy. So to answer your question, um, I, I see that there are two challenges for my colleagues and me when reporting uh, on climate change in uh, Vietnam. First of all, we work really hard to find solutions for our report, but uh, even when we find a solution, we still risk telling, giving the people phones hope because uh, we, we are not really sure if the solution uh, can really uh, address the problems. So for this point, I believe that uh, the media now today need uh, climate literacy, and that means that we need the help from, from the, the researchers. And um, so uh, two years ago, I was lucky to receive uh, some net funding to work really close with a research group from uh, uh, King Yang, Vietnam. And um, so um, I learned so many things about uh, wetlands, about water security and research protocol, and I made uh, a lot of connections with the scientists in the field. So I think that uh, such collaboration, such partnership um, is what needed uh, right now for, uh, for better communicating about climate change. And uh, may I end with uh, one last photo? Yeah, so um, this photo was taken in Dong Thap, uh, Vietnam and uh, um, the people there they have stopped uh, they they have stopped growing rice 
and uh, they now they grow chili pepper instead because uh, as a way to adapt to uh, the new the climate change. So um, I I believe that all of us here do love the story like this story with the smiles on the ladies. And I hope that today we will have a fruitful discussion on how to make this smile, how to make the collaboration happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mile. I, of course, yeah. I think um, th that's a good point. No, uh, and also earlier during the opening remarks, it was highlighted that climate change actually affects all of us. So it's not just important for scientists. It's not just important for policymakers, but actually it's more important for the general public to understand and to take action um, in their own um, you know, little ways. I would like to go, uh, go on with, with Kun Piyapon from uh, Bangkok Tribune. And I just want to step back a little bit on the discussion the whole day uh, with, with the theme of the roundtable, which is bridging science, policy, and practice. And I, I don't know if you would agree with me that media plays an important role in actually being the bridge among these three sectors. How, how, based from your experience, what does media play uh, in, in bridging these gaps between these uh, key, uh, key sectors? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer for inviting me to join this session. Uh, I got some points uh, to share with you also as a journalist who has been working on uh, reporting on the issues that you are working on now. Uh, from, from what my colleague just shared to you, actually is similar situation that we have been facing as a journalist. So uh, maybe uh, trying to uh, close the gap and bridge the dot actually is our motto since day one. I mean, uh, my own news agency since I first uh, since I first set it up uh, about now is four years four years ago now now is uh, in its fourth year. Uh, I think uh, that is. Uh, as a journalist who has been working on uh, news reporting for four years, right? I think we uh, share the same uh, perception or perspective that uh, there is a huge gap that still exists uh, between policymakers and the locals who live on the ground, especially uh, in this uh, challenging uh, time. I mean, uh, concerning climate change and whether uh, Weather extremes and uh, El Nino, the latest event that just happening, right? So I think uh, we've been, as a journalist, uh, we've been trying to uh, work to bridge the gap. If we're not, uh, if we are not uh, able to close it yet, uh, and uh, connect the dots so that people can see a bigger pictures, uh, so that they can get a better understanding. This is important because uh, it's about uh, making a decision and uh, having more participation in decision, in decision making, especially in this challenging time for Thailand, for instance, because we are now in a transition again and we need more participation from the people. Uh, that is a uh, I used to uh, report a lot as a journalist, but uh, when I uh, run this new agency, so we devote uh, the whole news agency to serve this purpose. And I realized that uh, to close the gap or to bridge the gap, we need knowledge. And uh, that is uh, comes to you, uh, the researchers, that we need uh, the body of knowledge from you uh, to help uh, doing this. Uh, I think uh, for, for uh, the issue uh, concerning uh, climate change, uh, from uh, what I've been working on, uh, uh, we, we uh, extensively rely on information from uh, international community because we find it hard that uh, we find hard that we uh, can get information that uh, relevant to uh, our readers here. So maybe this is the thing that uh, maybe we need to work together to uh, 
I'm not sure that uh, in uh, researchers community, you already have a certain uh, make, uh, institutions uh, to work on this specifically for the Mekong region. Uh, it's quite important because uh, we got many aspects to deal with the uh, climate science. For instance, we got to rely on the IPCC uh, climate impacts that we hardly find the answers for our region in particular yet. So that's why we cannot, like my colleague said, that uh, we cannot uh, tell people what the solutions for them. That is also the, the challenge for us all, I think, yeah. Great, uh, thank you, Kun Pia for, for yeah. setting up uh, um, a description of how media actually plays a role in, in bridging this gap. So I, I want to talk to Anton, who is a multimedia journalist from uh, Southeast Asia Globe based in Phnom Penh. Um, we are in, in a room full of scientists and policymakers. What do you actually need from them in order to create good stories? This is your time to, to talk to them. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here with all of you today, especially because I think the focus that Rajesh has asked me to, to highlight has been the use of multimedia in communicating all of our climate stories. And the number one thing that we need is time. So often I'm sent published peer-reviewed uh, research papers well after the fact that the research has been done that effectively kills any multimedia opportunities for folks to communicate. And it's exceedingly awkward because I didn't prepare any multimedia for this presentation, so I apologize. Um, but I would say that's the biggest thing. We're entering this new phase where multimedia, even now, isn't enough. So we create photos, videos, and graphics, but now we have to translate that onto TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or I'm sorry, X, uh, Facebook, and all of these other platforms. Um, so I think the number one thing that we need from both policymakers and more importantly, researchers doing field work is time and understanding of what you're doing before you do it. No offense, I've seen many photos taken by researchers. I think you need us too, and I think we need to partner. I've, I've, I've had this conversation, researchers have sent me you know, Google Drives full of photos that are unfortunately not the most usable when it comes to the news media. Uh, so I think it's really important in, in almost every case because to create this content, not only do we need to understand it, but we need to find new ways to tell it. I do think that there's a role in us you know, doing the best that we can to synthesize your research and write it in a more understandable way, but we have to go m far beyond that. I think we have to communicate it in different platforms. And I think, unfortunately, that's been a huge disconnect. And usually, you know, researchers spend so long and so much time on these excellent papers that once they're done, it'll be another three years <laughs> before we hear from, before we communicate again. And I, I've had a difficulties with that. So if you're in the process of creating this excellent research, which I know many of you are doing or, or formulating these policies, please let us know well before it's done. We are on tight timelines, but I would say most climate journalists generally aren't doing breaking news. You know, we don't get assigned a story and in 12 hours we have to publish it. We kind of have a different job where a lot of explanatory and investigative reporting comes in. So the time frames for climate newsrooms and climate reporters are a bit different than your standard news journalist. Um, and I would say that's the number one thing. There are other ways that I think we can improve our relationship. But I think making sure that you're comfortable having conversations with us and then setting the norms for that conversation in that first chat is really important. I do understand mm -hmm. that researchers have felt misrepresented by the press before. Um, so I think initially when we start talking, we can talk about the, the different factors of on the record, off the record, on background, and make sure that we're all on the same page before we start formal interview processes. So that's something I'd encourage all of you to do, especially because the independent press and state press and business-driven press are all, I guess, different forms of journalism. And I would hate for you to paint all of us with a single broad brush. Uh, before we expand the conversation with, with, our, with our distinguished um, participants as well, I just want to take a stab on what you said about time. And, and I want to direct the conversation about the, so, the use of social media. So social media actually is, uh, I would say, a double-edged sword because it democratizes access to information, but it also is a medium for disinformation and misinformation. So in, I'll, I'll lay out the question to the three of you. Based on your experience, what would be the best strategy from the media sector to actually fight um, 
climate denial or even misinformation and dis in disinformation related to climate science. Have you had any experience related to that or what would be your suggestion as a, as a general topic? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I would say that it's a stacked fight, right? Because the amount of time that it takes us to produce a single news story, somebody can create five stories that dispute that. So inherently, I think journalists who are already in a strapped industry, as I'm sure we're all aware, um, and we're inside a system that financially is not viable and is not working. I think the fight against misinformation and disinformation is stacked against us, um, especially because unfortunately people do paint with broad strokes, right? So they had a bad interview with the journalist, therefore all journalists are like this. Um, so I don't think there is an inherent solution yet that we're finding. I think making sure that you're speaking to independent, free and verified press is the most important thing. I think if you're getting interviewed by reporters in other countries and in newsrooms, perhaps you haven't heard, I think it's important to take a look at where those journalists are coming from, right? Fact check us. Because a lot of reporters will come to you and say, hey, I'm a journalist for X newsroom in whichever country. And then you find out much later that that's state backed or has different uh, agendas. So I think that would be one way that I'd say could, we could build a relationship between the free and independent press and re researchers across the region, but it's not, a, not definitely not a golden solution. How about you, Mille? You, you, you want you, yeah. yeah, I have something to weigh in here. So I'm going to tell you a, a story happening in Vietnam right now. So these days, the Facebook uh, in Vietnam is showered with debate about uh, a, a, a province in Vietnam plan to remove a forest, a part of a, a national forest uh, to build a lake. Uh, uh, that can provide water to the local people. So the, de the debate uh, is generally about uh, the benefit, uh, the water security of the local people and uh, the bigger interest of uh, uh, everyone else uh, related to a uh, forest. So, um, so on social media, uh, we, we can find uh, um, arguments from uh, uh, the local people, from uh, uh, celebrities, um, from uh, you know uh, forest enthusiasts, and also the researchers, and also the journalists, and um, uh, it's kind of messy, messy because uh, um, everyone have different perspectives, uh, have different evidence, uh, and um, so um, from my observation, I I think that um, of one of the strategy to uh, so uh, to um, deal with such situation is that we we should establish the the a platform or a channel that um, the the journalist and the researcher uh, keep uh, their long term communication so that whenever there are such a, such an event like I I, just, I share with you um, the journalist can quickly um, get the, the knowledge from the researcher and help them uh, raise their their voice, uh, have them show their their studies, their findings regarding to that topic. And um, we can, you know, let, um, make the debate less uh, messy. Uh -huh. And um, my second point is that I think that um, uh, facts it matters more than opinions. So for, for me, when I do my reporting, I try to be uh, as neutral as possible. I just give uh, out of the, the evidences, the facts, and try to uh, reframe the, opinion, the opinions to myself. Yeah. Great. Um, I would like to ask, I couldn't be upon, but, but I think we can uh, expand our conversation with our friends in the room. So Rajesh, do you have... Um, There are also a few journalists in the room, so please feel free to pitch in and uh, share your perspectives. Uh, meanwhile, Miko. <laughs> in disguise. I am not a journalist, but I'd like to say this because I did this when actually Carl and Kunke were actually doing the poll view v box in the last session. So I made a suggestion and I upvoted that suggestion several times that it gets to be number 13. I was the only one who voted for that. 
using three phones and clearing my cache several times. So processes such as this can be gamified. And the powerful and those endowed with resources, like three phones and the knowledge to clear the cache every time, will have their way. Repetitive voices may not represent reality. So we need to be careful with our assumptions, methodology, and interventions. Sometimes what gets into policies, narratives, and practices are from those who have the resources to make the noise the loudest. How do journalists such as yourselves deal with this data and information injustice? How do you deal with noise, basically? It's a loaded question. <laughs> well, at least for me, Miko, thanks for prepping me for this question last night during our conversation. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I think the biggest role that we have is to engage, unfortunately. These conversations with misinformation and noise happen with or without journalists. So I've always felt that it was our noise, our jobs to go into the noise and pull out whatever we can from it and try to find folks that are amplifying their voice in unreasonable ways. Again, that's a difficult part of the job and is not the only aspect of journalism that we all engage in. So is that the majority of what we do? No, certainly not. And a lot of journalists that I know, of course, would prefer to block out the noise because it can get incredibly negative and people can be quite, you know, uh, hateful online and that can be quite painful to deal with. But I would say at least something that I've tried to engage with more so is this noise and what's happening online and trying to see where that's coming from. Because I do completely agree. I think the loudest people in the room are misrepresented as a whole or the majority. And that's most certainly not the case, especially not when it comes to climate reporting or climate opinions. Um, so I think that's a really good question. Again, I don't think journalists inherently have a single answer for it. Right. Um, but at least on a personal level, I think it's better to engage and try to understand the noise than just pretending it's not there. Yeah, I have a quick um, intervention with that. I think one of the things that's, uh, I think that was embedded to me yesterday, there was a speaker who was saying that we shouldn't just listen to our like-minded individuals. We should also listen to divergent perspectives because maybe as a, as a scientist or maybe as a journalist, we already have certain biases, uh, certain, you know, looking at things in a certain way that we often dismiss those um, who are not, you know, the same with us. So I think it's equally important to really look into, and I've mentioned it a while ago, you know, step, um, you know, step backwards and really see where this divergent voices are coming from. So maybe there's some merit in listening to them. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm also not a journalist, but yeah. Um, Kunpiapon, do you have any? Um... Yeah, I think as a journalist, we uh, fundamentally, our work uh, forces us to open our minds to different voices already. I mean, uh, a professional journalist. I mean, uh, so we listen to all the voices as uh, as we can. And but what uh, what matters uh, is uh, the facts that drive uh, everyone to 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 the solutions. I mean, if we want to find solutions together, of course, like local people on the ground, they complain, but at most, uh, at the end of the day, we need facts or knowledge to clarify that or to, ref to verify that and then uh, get everyone on board uh, to find the solutions or the common ground together. That is what we have uh, been doing as a journalist. So I don't think that uh, noise or different voice are the problem because we are here to hear people to say something. but. My, the challenge uh, for me is that whether you got something for people to hear, especially the knowledge and the facts that help everyone get the solutions. And that is uh, something that also find the emerging issue that uh, Mr. Dwight just addressed, which is about the climate ignorance or climate denial. Uh, I mean, uh, down to the point, we use facts to fight. So that's why we have the fact-checking mechanism or the fact-checking process. That is something that I think uh, 
in this region, we lack uh, this body of knowledge to explain to people, to give uh, the answers to people. At least uh, when I asked uh, lately, I just organized the forum. Yeah, that is uh, the different work format that I've been doing in order to open the space for uh, all stakeholders to come together and then to discuss the issues to, uh, together and then find the solutions together. Even I asked uh, the El Nino's impact uh, here in Thailand, nobody can confirm me whether or not uh, people already affected by that, but we just learn from the international community that it's arrived. But for the short term or medium term or long term from now on, that people will definitely be uh, facing uh, the impacts from the El Nino. We, we have no idea yet. We don't know how to tell people how to prepare themselves. And this is quite critical when we uh, look at the, the government, the new government, the policymakers, if they don't have uh, this kind of idea in mind, that is going to be uh, a, a, a big challenge for the people. If you uh, heard about uh, recently about the government's policy, they don't, uh, they don't have uh, recognition or perception about uh, uh, natural resources and environmental management uh, compared with uh, other aspects like politics or economics. So that that is uh, the challenge for us. Or I think uh, get back to the facts and the knowledge that we want the most. And uh, for the social for the uh, social media for the use of social media, actually, it's not all negative. Uh, I've been working on this. Uh, news agency and I uh, have learned that uh, social media is uh, useful. At least that uh, we have learned that uh, to form our editorial. Uh, we don't need a lot of people like uh, we uh, ever did before because of the use of uh, technology and social media. We can get it done with uh, a far less number of people, far less number of journalists, and we can still communicate. So um, it depends on how how we deal with this, rather. Great. Uh, are there any other burning questions from our friends? Yes, uh, Ajahn uh, Krumji. I, oh, um, not, not questions, but because you were talking about some ideas on how to you know give you that long lead time to um, gather knowledge and, you know, get your thoughts together to write a good story. I'm a Blomjit. I'm a former journalist, uh, the nation newspaper some years ago, environment and foreign affairs. And then I'm also have done a lot of work on the other side of the table, um, press officer, communication manager for a host of UN agencies. But um, one thing just really recently that uh, we found out actually is also in Vietnam. Um, there's a big team doing work on um, sand mining issues there. You know, it's big news. But that, um, I'm going to put that aside because I'm giving a training tomorrow. <laughs> and I feel like I'm giving away the exercise. But because a lot of you won't be here, I'll tell you now. But a little bit before that, um, there was a time, 2000, 2004, 2005, WHO launched a campaign to um, vaccinate people who need vaccines, who could, who could no, not vaccine, need treatment to get it, at least half of them should get treated. But at that time, they were clearly going to miss the goal. So it was like a year of how do we deal with that? So it was a big communication advocacy strategy. And one of the things that they did, which I think really helped, was um, there was a monthly briefing to different types of stakeholders. There's a briefing for a press, for CSOs, including uh, very important for that particular issue on HIV was uh, faith-based leaders and organizations, also with donors, with all kinds of things. And that took a year, um, very methodical, providing briefing how the progress was being made on certain front, all fronts, um, and from the science to the 
everything you can you can do. So that's one way. Like and um, I get, just gave a training last week. Um, um, actually, just Monday um, to media officers and technical. And, and I thought I would say the most important thing you can do if you're a press person or you're a researcher or anyone wanting to really get the word out and working with the journalists is really to have a build a relationship, have a you know from long term relationship engage with them, talk to each other, share information, even if there's no real progress, but keep them informed. Here we are, we're, we're at this stage now, um, because it does take time, and climate change does take time, and there's so much information out there, but you know, build that. It could be something very informal. You can be like, we're, we're meeting every Friday, happy hour, at, I think there used to be a club near here called Front Page, is it still there? Yeah, and you know, do things like that, and it could be more formal. It could be editorial board meet meetings, briefings um, to reporters. Um, and my friend um, created an environmental journalist club that is now being replicated all over the world. He now works with um, earth journalism. So um, just some ideas. And if you want to know more, eh, you can come tomorrow. <laughs> Great. Um, you've mentioned happy hours. So we're a few minutes away from networking uh, and cocktails. So we're happy to entertain, I, th I think, one more question from, from the room. If there are any other burning comments or questions for, from our panel. I see our one of our summer net, oh, sorry, uh, Mekong Think Tanks fellows. Uh -huh. It's good also to have youth representations here. Yes, go ahead, Bob. Uh, my name is Samyang. I think I have no question, but it's kind of common uh, replying back to the question regarding the noise. I think there's two ways to listen based on my experience. So one, one is the fact check. I think the journalists, mostly independent journalists, they know the way how to fact check in terms of the story. So when there's noise coming from the people, so they fact check. So the fact check could be a balance between uh, religion, and also they going back to the question, calling up the NGO or the government. So government, they know. Uh, so to get the answer from government, do they, the people saying it true or not? And also we can go to a searcher or whatever. So another way is that, so when the, the first story, we rave up and then second choice that we go to investigate by ourselves. Example, uh, one of my experience, what I uh, did with maybe with Anton and with the another college in, in Globe, so when we conduct a story in terms of illegal fishing in the lease up, so we heard a lot of uh, voice from, from the local people. So we spent the whole week to investigate like in that lease up around all the area in the lease up, but we spent the whole week from the morning until the evening to, to gathering all information from those local community, from people, from fishery. So diversity is a way you know, to understand and then we go back and fact, fact check and those kinds of information and then conclusion with the government. So these are all the things that I think there's two common. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bong. I see, uh, okay. I Maybe we can go from uh, with the lady from the back. Um, My name is Lam Noi from Summonet for own uh, screening committee. Uh, I would like to add about, I am not sure about the situation in other country. However, in Vietnam, the very big gap between the uh, reali reality and uh, the um, uh, information show in social media. Uh, for example, uh, two years ago when I um, <laughs> Uh, when I apply for the funding uh, for the Euro Commission, uh, Euro Commission for uh, improving the hygiene and uh, sanitation system in uh, primary and secondary school, uh, the scientist and also the teacher in the school is very uh, carefully with journalists. They asked me many times that uh, if I was journalist, if I was journalist, I could not take the picture of current situation of hygiene and uh, and sanitation system in my school uh, because, uh, as you know, the journalist uh, in Vietnam and maybe other country have to uh, follow the information orientation from the government. 
so sometimes very big gap between the reality and the current the real situation and the scientists should very should also carefully with the journalist because sometimes the journalist the information in other side however the, the, the journalist we have to write by on the guidance by on the orientation from gov local government and central government in different way so uh, as you are journalist so how what is the solution for you to fill the gap uh, especially in two channel uh, formal channel and informal channel uh, for communications uh, especially for uh, community social media this is my question yeah thank you any comments from our panel how do you fill in that gap uh, uh, from vietnam maybe <laughs> <laughs> well um i am uh, an independent journalist so i cannot really uh fully answer your question, but from my uh, experience, I now I still have to work with a state-owned news outlet to get my story published. And uh, I think what I do is that I try to convince the, the editor-in-chief about, um, you know, about the true story behind uh, in reality. And, uh, and and the rest will be the responsible of the editor to work with her boss, her his or her bosses in higher level to to get the 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 the, the true interview the, the the real story um uh reach um to other people. So what I'm trying to say here is that um I I do agree with Miss Lam Noi and uh, but also I believe that um the journalism in Vietnam nowadays, um, they are also, um, we, they are, we do know about the problem and we are try, trying to find our ways to, to um, at the same time deal with the, the, the government, uh, the direction and at the same time um, can uh, do our responsibility as a reporter. Great. Uh, one more question uh, before we close. Uh, just just before we go to that question, I just okay. wanted to add also that, uh, for example, there is, I know in this room, the Climate Change Film Festival people, and this is a climate change film festival that happens every year in February. And nowadays we have to think of those things as well, not just news outlets and reporters, but there are, there are policymakers that come and actually watch those films. So if you're doing short films on climate change, you actually have a very good chance of reaching uh, the public and policymakers through such avenues as well. What do you I, I, sorry, I would like to add one more point that uh, from my experience, um, it's easier to pitch the story if I can, um, uh, I can show that I have some collaboration with uh, the renowned university on institution. It will be uh, get help my story more convincing. So getting the right contacts, right? Okay, just one last before we close. Yes, okay, I'll try to be quick on this one. Um, my name is Buki, I um, work in Summernet as a fellow and I also lead the Summernet Young Professionals Network. And within our network, we've been doing um, uh, some social media and communication, uh, advertising about uh, the research that Summernet does for a while now. And I just want to get a quick thought from the panelists as um, I think the three of you are professional journalists and professional media storytellers, but um, just a quick thought, what are your opinions on uh, encouraging or using the a more organic social media to inform um, citizens or um, get some or bridge between research and policy um, because just uh, letting you know that for some countries uh, journalists or uh, media that come out of professional journalists or news media is uh, sometimes it's uh, it's not accurate and and I, I can say this as I'm from Laos and you know the situation in media in Laos and it's quite hopeless um, to find um, information that reflects the opinions of 
people in the suicide or uh, situations in our countries from journalists, professional media, uh, we tend to go to Facebook as our Google, you know. So just a quick thought from you, what are your opinions in um, using an uh, organic uh, social media approach? Is that something that we would want to encourage more um, to, to develop this kind of approach to bridge between science and policy? Thank you. Anyone who wants to answer that? Or organic social media meaning climate scientists, policymakers actually communicating the stories or? Through media. So okay. organic means not through professional medias like journalists or news uh, anchors, but from using social media, um, free post uh, contents, you know, free platforms to post contents like that. Right. Yeah. I feel like it's stacked because if we say it's a great idea, then we'll all be out of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> No, but actually, I think that question is should be directed to this side of the the room. I think uh, policymakers, scientists. I mean, social media is out there. Um, feel free to to uh, you know put in your information there and link with formal journalists so they can actually re-echo and reiterate your message. I can see still several hands, but how are we with time? We're bad in time. Okay, well, um, last one. Okay, Dr. Edwin. I just want to reply on this because uh, formerly I used uh, community radio. This is uh, the local media. It is good for empowering people and community and explaining something very, very nice. But uh, I think we lack of the fin financing for sustainable finance financing. So this must be, must be solved for a while. But this is a very good idea about the radio community, community radio. Thank you very much. Great. Um, good point. My background is actually community radio, but um, Anton. I guess I just wanted to really quickly address that. I'm going to put aside the journalism hat and just speak as a storyteller and a climate communicator. I think organic media in, other in many countries in Southeast Asia makes sense. I think the way that we look at professional journalism and professional media is a very you know Western view. I think we look at the society of professional journalists and we take those standards and we do try to apply them here. And that can't operate in the vast majority, I would say, of Southeast mm -hmm. Asian nations. So I think if researchers were really keen to, to work in certain countries, unfortunately, yeah, the free and independent press is not an option in, mm -hmm. in every country in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think exploring those opportunities are important. It is a double-edged sword. Right. The issue with organic media and social media is that the ethics or the code of standards is not equally distributed across all. So I think it's something that's important to look into, especially if people here are keen to communicate different climate, um, new climate information. But, you know, I think it's important and equally dangerous the same way that, you know, trying to apply Western media standards in other countries is equally just as dangerous as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a it's a dreadful double-edged sword, um, but certainly important to look into. Yes, thank you very much for for that uh, concluding note. Um, speaking of, if if the panel would allow me, if Rajesh would also allow me, I think just to wrap it all up, I think the challenge really is finding human interest story that make that will make public be interested in the stories. And another point is finding. Um, a way or a mechanism to actually communicate uh, climate science and climate uh, information in a more approachable, in a more you know retweetable. Sorry if I if I can say that uh, manner. Speaking of which, I would like to invite I think our colleagues from Tofu Creatives, Des, who actually, I mean their role is also actually communicating the things that we've been discussing the whole day. So Des, uh, would you like to? Um, um, briefly talk about uh, the, the, the things that we've discussed in this panel and also on the wrap-up panel. Right. Okay, for this one, so uh, we heard to include solutions and reporting to close the gap between policymakers and communities, include media in the research process, have a platform uh, for media and scientists to have continuous communication, Listen to divergent perspectives, use the facts to fight, localizing information, and the big question also how to deal with data and information injustice. And also the message on the importance of building relationships. Thank you, Dwight.
And with that, uh, thank you very much to our panel. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to pass the mic to Charmaine.